Well, we did it. You know, when I started this channel, I certainly never expected to get much of an audience. I just wanted to share my swords, talk about them, and learn about them. But now that I'm sitting here with a thousand subscribers, all I can do is say thank you. It is incredibly humbling that so many people seem to enjoy watching my videos. And to celebrate this milestone, I'm going to be reviewing the most expensive sword in my collection and its crown jewel. This is the Golden Dream by Polish blacksmith Damian Solowski of Historical Sword Zone. So a little background about the maker. Damian Solowski makes the blades and puts everything together and his wife Katarzyna, I apologize for my pronunciation, does all the leather work. They kind of tag team in making these swords and everything they make is absolutely gorgeous. They're all historically inspired and Damien generally seems to focus more on mid to later medieval period swords, although there are some that are earlier period. Here's a few examples of his work. Just absolutely stunning stuff, every single one of them. And when I bought this sword, the price was 2,700 euros, which at the time translated to 3,200 US dollars. On his website, Mr. Solowski has this sword listed as an Oakshot Type 18C. I can see why he would classify it like that, although to me, it's not quite as broad at the base as most 18Cs, so this might fit better as an 18A. But frankly, it doesn't really matter. You know, there's so many different 18 types and subtypes with very subtle differences between them, except for some of the more outlier ones, like the 18E has very specific types. But this fits into a type 18 sword, or any of its subtypes. It doesn't really matter exactly which one it, it fits in most neatly. So this type of sword is going to be a cut and thrust focused sword, although with this the tip geometry on this one, which is not reinforced, it's going to be a little more focused on cutting than thrusting. Want to help out my channel and support a great cause? Then check out my merch store at www.alien2.com. 25% of the profits of every sale will be donated to the American Cancer Society, and the rest will be used to help the channel continue to grow. Thanks for your support. So let's take a look at the scabbard. First off, this is just simply gorgeous. The leather work here is just simply beautiful, both the design and the execution. Fit-wise, there's quite a bit of rattle here and basically no retention at all, which is a bit of a shame. Both the leather work and the design just really make everything pop. Now, it is a little bit on the chunky side. It's a little thicker than you would typically see on a medieval scabbard. But, you know, that's not really a big deal. The belt is also just gorgeous. A lot of beautiful stamping, some nice concho decorations. It is a little bit on the thin side, but it works perfectly fine. I'm not going to go through and actually put it all on because, frankly, I'm never going to actually wear this, so I don't need to. Let's take a look at the hilt, starting with the pommel. It's inspired by the group of Type T pommels. There's probably about six variants, and I don't think this one fits neatly into any type, but it's clearly in inspired by that style of kind of a fishtail, kind of a pear. It could be, you know, you can call it almost anything you want. It's got an absolutely beautiful finish on it, very clean, very even, and all the edges are chamfered very nicely. I can grip the sword at, with the pommel, doesn't feel bad or have any hot spots at all. The peen is very nicely done. It is cleaned up beautifully, no errant hammer marks that can be seen. Just really nicely done. There's some extra dimension to this pommel. It starts thinner here at where it meets the grip and then swells out towards the peen, which is a, a nice touch. There's actually a lot of dimension to this pommel with the center ridge and it's just, it's a really nice pommel that is very effective and looks very nice as well. Moving on to the grip, I really like the shaping here. It's mostly flat on the planes here and then rounded on the edges, which makes indexing the blade very easy. And I love the wasted shape in both portions. And it's just gorgeous. Once again, superb leather work here. I like how there's some decoration stamped and painted here and then a cord wrap texture on the bottom half 
and the transitions are perfect. There's no way there's any hot spots here. It overlaps the both the cross guard and the pommel perfectly. And this is a long grip, especially when you add in the pommel. This lets you grip down at the pommel and at the top and separate your hands for more leverage in the cut, which is a nice touch. The seam in the grip is stitched, and these stitches are prominent, but there's absolutely no discomfort when gripping it. I can swing and not and feel them, but not have any discomfort at all. The cross guard is your classic Oakshot Type 8, which was probably made most famous by the Black Prince sword. This one has a lot of nice dimension to it and very crisp lines. All the lines are very well defined but chamfered nicely and there's a good amount of taper to it starting thicker at the where it meets the grip and then tapering out nicely to the ends of the quillings. The finish is just like the pommel beautiful very even no errant marks at all. The gap is nicely small although I have seen better before still it looks it looks very appropriate. And now it's time to talk about the business end, the blade. So the sword starts at about 5.8 millimeters thick with a pretty even distal taper down to about two and a half millimeters right before the tip. This leads to a blade that's actually quite flexible. I'm not putting much effort in it, I'm getting quite a bit of flex here. But it does return to true nicely, which is important. And if I whack the pommel, you can see it does have quite a bit of flexibility to it. And you know, that amount of flexibility means that this sword probably is not the best thruster, except against soft targets. Anything hard, it's just going to flex and not penetrate. The finish on this sword is absolutely outstanding. It's a satin with absolutely no errant grind marks or anything. It's just one smooth finish the entire way through the entire blade. And that goes for the symmetry too. This sword is pretty much perfectly symmetrical, which funnily enough actually makes it probably not particularly historically accurate because, you know, in medieval times they didn't really have the obsession with symmetry that we do now in the modern times. And this sword, if it was taken back in time, they probably would think it was a magic weapon or blessed by the god because it's so perfectly created. So this would be a king's sword or perhaps a very high-ranking noble sword. The tip is nicely acute and, as I said, perfectly symmetrical. And it has a bit of an ogive curve up here rather than a straight taper into a needle point. The edge geometry here is very good. It goes from the center ridge down to the edge with one straight bevel, although there is a very, very small micro bevel that is barely noticeable. It's very even and you can really only notice it with shining a light on it. So let's test the sharpness with some paper. Just insert it in. I'm just going to do, let the sword do the cutting. So that's very even and very smooth. So it's got a very polished edge, but I am having to put a little bit more of a, a not, I won't say power, but I am having to drive the sword into it a little bit rather than just very smooth, even slicing. So the edge is polished very nicely as that, how even the paper cutting shows, but how sharp is it? Well, let's take a look at some cutting footage to find out. So you can see on those water bottles, it 
did okay. Not great. It definitely did some more bashing them than cutting nicely. Now let's take a look at something I've never cut before. Tatami. I had to do something for a thousand subscribers, so why not use some tatami? First off, excuse my horrible job staking the tatami onto the stand. It's something I need to get better at. And unfortunately, the Golden Dream just did not cut the tatami very well. And I did do some more cutting with other swords that day, and they cut better. What happened with this one most of the time is that it cut about halfway to three-fourths of the way through the tatami and then just got stuck and threw the tatami and the stand on the ground. I did get one good clean cut with the sword, but I had to put a lot of power into it, considerably more than I think I should have to. Handling. This Golden Dream is weighs a little over three pounds and is balanced very close to the cross guard at about two inches. That makes it, even though it's three pounds, which is not on the heavy side for a longsword, about normal for a longsword, I would say, but that balance point makes it feel incredibly light in the hand. It doesn't feel like there's much, it feels lighter than it is, and it doesn't feel like there's a whole lot to it. So. It doesn't have a ton of authority in the cut because the balance point's so far back, but because it has such a long grip with the pommel, you can get more leverage by separating your hands. Like if I put it up here, my hands up there, that doesn't even feel good. I need to, yeah, I need to put my hands down on the pommel to get it to feel pr correct for the way to swing it. And, you know, I have good point control because it is a nimble sword that feels good to move around. You'll notice probably, I know I noticed just moving it around, it flexes a lot up near the tip and that's because it's such a flexible blade. It's probably, in my opinion, a little too thin there. It, I think it would be better if it started just a touch thicker here, like maybe even half a millimeter thicker and then just maintain to that thickness for most of the blade and maybe just towards the end start getting to the thickness here. Just to give it a little bit more rigidity that would help both in cutting but especially in thrusting because right now I'm pretty confident if I thrust against anything that was had any resistance to it this would flex so much that it wouldn't really do a good job thrusting. And type 18 swords generally are supposed to be balanced between cutting and thrusting and I think I feel like this one is balanced more towards cutting than thrusting but it's incredibly easy to move around and you know if I I can redirect the cut very easily continue the motion easily and just this actually makes I think for a pretty good sword to just kind of practice with, you know, kind of just go through forms and practice because it's light and it's easily maneuverable. So it, you go, going through the forms is easy and fun. Probably not the best actually in terms of uh, building up uh, durability, not durability, building up uh, stamina so that you can you know, fight with the sword longer. But in terms of just moving it around, it just, it feels so good. So uh, I have here another utterly outstanding sword. This is the Vision Tauber, which is an 18B based on an Angus trim sword. And I believe this one's lighter. It feels lighter overall, although the balance point is definitely further out. I think this one is right around four inches, if I, just judging that. and feels a little bit more authoritative in the cut. 
feel like I have pretty much, pretty similar tip control, maybe a bit less here. And considerably less flexibility. Like if I actually flex it, it definitely has some flex to it. Just not as much as the Golden Dream. This is also an absolutely superb sword. So, you know, it's, they feel, they both feel fantastic, just in slightly different ways. This one has a little more authority in the cut. The Golden Dream is a little bit heavier, but doesn't really feel that much heavier because the point of balance is so close. And overall, it handles incredibly well. And now it's time to talk bottom line. Was this sword worth the $3,200 I paid for it? Well, I think that depends on the intended use. As a backyard cutter, no, this is not worth it. First off, for $3,200 on a backyard cutter, this is too beautiful. I wouldn't want to spend that much money for a backyard cutter. And secondly, the sharpness just isn't there. It's not that it's got a bad sharpening job, it's just not polished and sharp enough to really do a good job cutting. But you know what? I didn't buy this to be a backyard cutter. In fact, I didn't ever intend to cut with this sword. The only reason I did is because every time I handle it, it just begs to be used. But I bought this sword for as a showpiece, as the crown jewel of my collection. And for that, you know, the looks are so important. And this sword not only delivers in the looks, it knocks it out of the park. This is the best looking sword I own, bar none. So in terms of a pure showpiece, yes, I think this sword was worth $3,200, and I would buy it again for that price. Once again, I want to thank each and every one of you subscribers for your support. It frankly boggles my mind that I've already gained 1,000 subscribers, and I can't wait to see where this channel goes in the future. Until next time, though, Alien 2 out.